Hi, this is Dave Weber with Tech Weekly Live. Um, we have an awesome topic today, um, and it's this world of call recording, uh, which, you know, I think a lot of people first gravitate to, but, you know, it kind of falls into this bucket of WFO, workforce optimization, workforce management. And we have a brand new resource, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jim Witchberg. First, Jim, awesome, excellent choice in coming to work for us. Welcome. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Well, it's it's so cool to have you here. You know, you came from uh, Servion, you know, which is one of the partners that we work with um, quite a bit on on uh, these kinds of projects. And um, you know, it, it was just great to have you, you know, working for us live as we as Tom begins insourcing a lot of these kinds of things. So good to have you. I do a little bit. Do me a favor and give me a quick little intro of what do you do and and. Uh, uh, what do you like to do in, in your spare time, and, and what, what are some of your tasks here at, here at Aero SI? Sure, no problem. Um, I was brought on, as you mentioned, the uh, WFO world uh, to be the uh, practice lead, and um, I think uh, I'm, looking for, I'm looking forward to it because, to me, it's a step up from where I was. Uh, I've been around the call center world for a long time and, you know, focusing on Avaya technology, um, from routing, from putting in servers, from working with communication manager to CMS, et cetera, and then recently, last couple of years, into the WFO world. Um, that's, you know, from a technical background, some of the things that I like to do is big sports guy, big football guy. Um, are you guys going to say? A big Green Bay Packer it? guy? Is that Green Bay <laughs> Packers, right? Yeah, and that's totally yeah. normal. It's, it's, very, it's very common. So don't don't, don't yeah, forget about yeah, it. I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> so, but um, so yeah, so my 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 world there include I actually was an NFL replacement official three years ago. So oh, wow. I had fun with that. Yeah, I can give you some real interesting stories there. <laughs> I bet. Um, so yeah, that'll be a podcast all by itself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but from a WFO perspective, yeah, I mean it's funny. The first thing you said, and it's very interesting in the WFO world, is just understanding the acronyms. Yeah, so it's, it's it's amazing when people say, "Oh, I want to buy WFM," or "I want to buy WFO," or this or that. Um, it's just very, very interesting, and I'm glad you introduced it with actually saying workforce optimization, which of course is the just the umbrella acronym for all these products that are part of it. One of which is WFM, workforce management. So, but that's what I'm doing. I'm going to help with. Um, I'm actually working with North Shore right now, or Northwell now. Uh, big client um, with their application and product and going to go forward and help anybody that needs help and uh, help with the installs and, and pre-sales and post-sales and whatever I can. So it's not necessarily that you're going to be doing a lot of these installs yourself, right? But you, you're one of those guys who's done the installs, who knows yep. the, the, what goes on and, and what has to happen in a successful engagement, and so you're kind of helping to manage and, and create, make sure those scopes are are accurate, and that the tasks are complete, and, and that we know what, again, what makes a happy a happy customer at the end of the end of the engagement. Is that is that yep. a good summary? That's perfectly well said. Exactly. Perfect. Um, yeah. One of the one of the big keys with all. And I'll call them WFO engagements because, as you mentioned, there's a bunch of products. And the very, the very basic product of WFO is call recording. And a lot of companies want to do that. And we deal with several different vendors, Avaya being one, and they have their own recorder. And uh, then from there on, you go to other applications like Quality Monitor. They call it QM, where you can actually score the call while you're listening to it. And then further down the line, you get performance management, which are scorecards and, like, dashboards for supervisors that include data uh, from call data, like from CMS. And then going further, you got workforce management, and then deeper, there's speech analytics and even uh, higher applications as well. But one of the keys, because they're so sophisticated and there are so much to these, is actually helping the customer understand what they need to do. Um, it's a very significant infrastructure investment uh, that you have to do, typically Windows servers. Um, now, going forward, the Avaya recording is actually Linux servers. Um, but and then you have Microsoft SQL involved because the databases are quite large. I mean, there's 13 databases that encompass well over 500 tables. 
And so you can imagine that's just the WFO or the WFM side. Uh, the recorders have their own database as well. So, yeah. it, but uh, but my my role is going to be to help the customer work with the the salesman, work with the uh, design guys, and 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 help the customer understand what their role is going to be, what kind of infrastructure they got to provide. But I'll work with the people who are doing the installations and make sure that the installs go smooth. Uh, by you know my experience with what pitfalls. Uh, you come up with um, when you're installing these kind of applications and because you could have a small one with one call center and maybe 50 agents all the way up to like oh, six or seven different sites, eight different recorders, four different servers involved with the WFO. So, you know, they can be small, but they can be quite large, and the customer just needs a lot of help. Um, it, it, the biggest thing is setting the customer's expectation. I mean, it's as simple as that. You know, you go in and, yeah, the, the, the call recording and, you know, being able to play the call back and actually screen recording and being able to score the call and, and now speech analytics, all these applications are really cool. They're really neat. And you see a demo and, oh, my God, they are so cool. But, boy, if you don't set it up right, you don't design it right, and you don't set the infrastructure up right, yeah, you're going to have an unhappy customer. And that seems to have been – the history that I have seen going into this. And it's just, as I said, if, you, if we just got to properly set the expectation of the customer, sit down with them, yeah, here's the demo. The product does look great. The product does work. If it's designed properly and if it's used properly, and that's another thing because training, you know, workforce management, for example, is a, is a good application. It's part of the WFO umbrella, but it's like, to be honest with you, it's like 10% installation at slash configure, or I should say installation, but like 80, 90% in configuration and training. So that's a huge area where you just have to set their expectation properly to understand what they need to do and get ready for this. But if you do it right and you design it right, I mean, I've seen some installations where customers are very, very happy with it. So, you know, there are a lot out there. There's a lot of choices uh, for the customer. And, you know, as I said, the demos are great. The product is good. It does work. It's just setting the customer's expectation as to what they're going to need to do uh, from their infrastructure because the product's great, but if you don't have the right infrastructure, Windows servers, SQL is typically involved. Uh, there's a lot of Windows settings. There's a lot of Active Directory work. You know, there's a lot of things that need to be done from their perspective. And, you know, if you set that expectation properly and you get and you help them along with that, then, boy, after the fact, day two, uh, it, it's a lot easier. Hey, can I uh, – Andrew mentioned it in, in a term that I, I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into. Yeah, SIPREC. You know, Andrew, can you give, give me a little let's, – let's give the group a little understanding of that and, and how, why that's so significant when we start talking about SIP trunks. Oh, sure. Well, yeah, I was, oh, who, oh, Jim, did you want to take it? Why don't you take it, Jim? You're no, there. I was just going to mention that was an interesting term, and uh, probably most of us know it's SIP recording. Uh, but it is relatively new in the in the recording world because SIP for you know most part instance is relatively newer um, and coming into the world. But now go ahead and we say I'm just going to say that was an interesting term you brought up and yeah that we're we're going to see that a lot coming up. Sure. Um, well, basically, uh, SIPREC is yes, it's SIP call recording. It's it's. Traditionally, or I shouldn't say traditionally, because as you said, it is new, but you would mostly find it on an, a session border controller. So you'd have the SIP trunks coming into a session border controller. The session border controller will then, in, assess, in essence, fork the call off to the recorder as it passes the call into the communication system. As opposed so, to? Uh, as opposed to what they've done in the past. Well, in the SIP world, what they've done in the past is they've had all sorts of proprietary interfaces. So Acme had their own way of doing it, and Sonus had their own way of doing it, and everybody had to basically go and create their own way of forking the call and send the media over, and they had to make sure that it worked with that particular vendor. SIPREC came along to say, hey, why don't we just take all these hodgepodge proprietary solutions and create a standard out of it? Well, and it, even, even before the forking, though, I guess I'm, I was leading more towards, okay, if you, if you have to send it all the way back to Communication Manager, you're, you're just going to destroy yourself in the number of DSPs that you need, right? 
Um, possibly, yes, possibly. Um, but and, and they're different way. I mean, when you send it to communication manager, you have a whole different way of doing the recording. And then you get into, uh, you know, you know, putting in an AES server and DMCC licenses and getting agent licenses. You've got all the line side stuff. Not that it's a bad thing, but it can often become a very expensive solution. I think people are looking towards SIPREC and recording it basically as a trunk side recorder to actually lower their costs. So, again, so, um, so SIPREC, again, is the standard way to do it. Um, it passes not only the media, it passes quite a bit of metadata along with the call as well so that it allows the recorders to know exactly what this call is, should they record it, what sort of uh, properties does the call have, um, and then so that metadata can get stored with the call and also can be used by the call recorder to determine whether they really want to record this call or not. So there's a whole kind of a handshake that goes on with SIPREC before the call is actually recorded. So that, that's basically what SIPREC is, trunk side recording for SIP off of a session order controller. So, Jim, you know, so Andrew kind of covered it from an SBC standpoint. Well, I, is it is it a common thing on the recording side yet? Or, or you know, I think the big players do it, but who – and are there gotchas that you've, you've run into already? It's relatively new. Um, it is, and it's a very unique skill set. Um, you, as you, as uh, Andrew mentioned, it comes – you know, it's basically trunk side recording using SIP trunks. And you have to configure it, and it is a less expensive way because of all the, as you mentioned, the DMCC and TSAPI licenses. Um, you don't have to get them. But as I mentioned, it's a very unique skill set. It's basically it uses SIP, um, but it, it, it adds a layer of information inside of a SIP message. You, you may have heard of the invite message. The invite message yeah. is something that establishes a SIP call. Well, with SIPREC, not only do you have the media description, but they will have this whole XML portion that talks all about the call. That's the metadata that gets sent over that says, hey, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Recorder, I want, here's a bunch of information about this call. I want you now to use whatever rules that you're using to tell me, hey, should we record this call or not? Okay. So there's kind of, again, there's this sort of this handshake that's going to go on between the session border controller and the recorder, and it's this metadata, this XML encoded data that gets sent over. And that's really what SIPREC is. SIPREC is the definition of the XML data that gets passed back and forth between um, the, the call recorder and then the SBC. Hey, Andrew, is that, does that typically go straight from the SBC to the recorder, or does that somehow go through like something like Session Manager to, to be further manipulated, or...? It's straight through. It's, it's straight there's, through. There's, there's no session manager involved here. It goes, okay, just an IP connection straight between the SBC and the... Yeah, and, 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 I, don't want, yeah, and I don't want to get too much into session border controller design, but one of the things you have to realize is you're now duplicating the media streams. So, you, you know, and the media is what consumes most of the processing power and the bandwidth on a NIC card. So you need to be really careful about... Oh, so when 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 uh, you need to be careful as you're engineering your session border controller to say I'm really adding a lot of extra media because not only you're recording you're you're sending the media off to the, the like the Avaya system or the Cisco system or whatever but you're actually sending the media now another the, the doubling the media and you're sending it over to the call recorder and you're sending it as both the sender and the rece receiver so you've got two media streams going to the call recorder you've got the media stream that's coming in and coming out from the communications manager, if you're running on one NIC card and that's just a, you know, a gig E, you've got to think about, have I engineered this thing enough? If I'm, how many calls can I run through this thing? Because I'm, I'm chewing up a lot of bandwidth for this call recorder. That's one of the things you need to think about as you engineer a SIPREC solution is, is the whole media engineering. Question um, for Andrew or actually for Jim. Um, in, the, in the TDM world, if I recall correctly, trunk side recording didn't offer the same granular information that a line side recording provided. Um, is that tr was, is that true, and would that also be true in the SIP world? Well, it'll only know what the trunks know, so it'll only know what the SBC knows. So, <clears throat> if there's other information that could have been part of the call that may have been gathered by an IVR or some sort of uh, skill set routing, it won't, it won't know that because it won't have got that far. So it, so it really is whatever the trunk knows. Whatever the SPC knows is what SIPREC will know. It won't know anything beyond that. So, you, Jim, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time 
just now talking about call recording, which usually you think of as uh, maybe the the, I don't know, the first thing you think of when you think of WFO, you think of call recording, and you know when is that true or not? But then you know what beyond call recording, what's usually the next level of adoption? I mean, is it the ability yeah. to to play that back and score it? I mean, what in the hierarchy of uh, you know, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs of call recording, um, what, what, what does everybody start with, and then what do people gravitate to, and is there a particular order, um, or how would you, yeah. how would you yeah, organize that? Yeah, typically, call recording, as I mentioned, the WFO, Workforce Optimization Platform World, whatever you want to call it, call recording is typically your basic, and that comes with search and replay. So, and that will may also come with screen recording. So that's your basic level of WFO, your number one application. Typically, people will gravitate from there. It could be either what they call QM, which is quality monitoring. And when you add QM, um, you're adding the ability that when you do search and replay a call, and it could have video or just audio, a screen will come up with a scorecard uh, where you evaluate and you, you, you modify, you create these scorecards based on your business and you answer questions. Did they, did they answer the call happily or right? Were they friendly? Did they uh, c confirm the customers, the caller's information, yada, yada. So that's kind of the QM piece, which is typically next, um, which, else, which also could be next could be workforce management. And workforce management is obviously not really related to call recording such. It's workforce management, and that is forecasting and scheduling and adherence, adherence being the ability to see what an agent's doing right now. And that information all comes from CMS for the most part in the Ohio world. And so you have a screen that says, okay, this is what the agent was scheduled for, and, of course, this is what they're doing right now. They're on a call, they're in aux work, they're in after call work, whatever, and, of course, are they in adherence or out of adherence? And then there's another application called performance management, and that's scorecards, and that's the ability to get KPIs. And the KPIs are, you know, your, your call center KPIs. Basically, the information comes from CMS, and you're talking about speed of answer, handle time, service levels, things like that. But that information can come into the WFO or performance management database, and you can create supervisor dashboards. And those dashboards can be, you know, bar graphs, just standard reports of those KPIs. You can do it by agent. You can do it by group. And then along with those type of KPIs, you can bring in the grades of the calls that you graded for the quality management. So that's performance management. So you've got your recording. You can go to QM. You can go to performance management if you want the KPIs. And you can go to workforce management. And they're kind of the big four of workforce optimization. And then beyond that, you get your more higher-level applications like speech analytics and uh, process analytics, which is a very, very cool application. Um, I've installed that and used that, and it, it really the ability to have a company understand everything that an agent does on their desktop. So it, it's really neat. I mean, it's almost like Big Brother watching because you are seeing every – every application the agent goes to, every website the agent goes to, exactly the process they go from A to Z to help a customer. And you can record all that information and then kind of validate it and then manipulate it into a training class or, or just simply KPIs on how long it takes to handle a call, first call resolution, et cetera. So that's speech analytics, or that's DPA, desktop process analytics. And of course, speech analytics is, we all know, it just simply analyzes and transcribes your calls and certainly gives you a text of all the calls. And, and once it's fine tuned, and speech analytics is a very, um, it's very heavy in consulting because you have a lot of speech tuning to do. Out of the box, it's a nice application, but to be honest with you, out of the box, you're probably getting one out of every two words that are actually transcribed. So you have to fine-tune that as the weeks and months go on. But that's a pretty nice high-level application, and that's where you get the ability kind of to say, okay, let me see all the calls where somebody said escalation. And that's very interesting to customers. And now the newer last couple of years with speech analytics is real-time speech analytics, which means when somebody says escalation on a call, it has the ability to send a pop-up or a note to a supervisor to say, hey, get on this call. We've got an issue. 
So they're kind. That's kind of like the level as you go through from the workforce optimization platform. So is is speech analytics, you know, at least in the scenarios you described of the um, um, maybe the the historical speech analytics, is is that usually associated with that quality monitoring, you know, where you're doing scorecards, where because a lot of times we'll typically just do a statistical, hey, you know, give me 10% of the of the recorded calls, and then I'll I'll go through manually and score them, as opposed to now you could say, okay, now show me 10% of all the ones where they said you dirty rotten scoundrel. <laughs> and yeah. let's score those separately, um, yeah. you know, or, or it's, sorry, is, is that typically how it's, it's kind of associated with the quality monitoring, at least from the historical standpoint? I haven't really seen that that much. I mean, okay. I, I've seen companies use the quality monitoring just for that. They, they, they get in, it's like an inbox, it's called. So the, the QM person gets so many calls per day, and that's their job. They go through, they listen, they watch, they see the screens, and they score it. But, you know, I haven't seen too many customers say, oh, this would be great. Let me get speech analytics to determine how many call or the, the quality to say, okay, these calls I've graded, now listen to them or, or see the speech and see all the words in those calls or vice versa. I haven't really seen that linked together as much. Not that you couldn't, mm -hmm. and it might be an interesting selling point, um, obviously, but most people, the speech analytics is just an application that once it's fine-tuned, I mean, the ability to go in to say, give me all the calls where they said they um, – uh, what else? Like you said, you dirty rotten scrounger, or, or a, a competition, a competitor's name, or your service stinks, or something. Whatever the case may be, it's a pretty powerful tool, um, and and it does. It's an interesting way to do it. And now they have actually, you know, we have a call that's played back, and you see the audio waves. Well, now depending, you know, with the right kind of setup, you see the audio waves of both the caller and the agent, and of course it has. I forget what the terminology is, but they, it can measure the emphasis in the word. It can, you know, somebody's talking louder, or or they consider it a high voice. Yeah, the inflection or, or the, uh, the inflection yeah, the, the sentiment. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and then people yelling or whatever. But now with the proper with the proper setup, you see the audio waves of both the agent and the customer, and you see the words of both the agent and the customer. So. You can go and find out what, you know, certain calls with certain phrases and words from the customer as well as the agent. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful tool. But, again, that's one of those applications. It's not cheap. Um, and, again, from an installation versus what I'll call configuration perspective, you're looking at about 10% installation. I mean, it's easy to install a speech analytics server. There's two of them. There's a transcription server, and then there's called an application server, and you have to have one of them for each language. So that's another thing to consider, too. But installing them is really not hard. It's very, very simple. It takes about two hours. But now the fun begins because out of the box, as I mentioned, you start using it, and you'll get like one, not even 50% of the words transcribed. That's when you've got to start listening to the calls, watching them, and come up with the words and phrases that are important to your company and then get them through what is called phonetic boosting to tune and then, you know, when six months go down the road, you're transcribing now 75, 80% of the words you want to hear, and that's when it gets really valuable. And, and typically you're not doing it to literally transcribe the, the recordings, are you? Is it, is it more, almost more of a, a tagging, you know, so that I can go back and search for certain kinds of things? But I, 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 or, or are you doing it literally? I want, I want to see a text version of every, every recording that that's we have. That's what it does. Okay. That's exactly what it does. There's a database that, believe it or not, when it will transcribe every call. It will go through – well, not everyone. Of course, you say, like you said, how many percent of calls do I want to? Because realistically, you get 10,000, 20,000 calls a day. You're not going to – you know, you better have a pretty powerful system to transcribe every one of them. Yeah. But you transcribe a certain percentage, and it actually creates a, a – there's a database that if you look at a call, it will have every word. That it transcribes successfully in mm -hmm. that call. So you can get a text version of the call if you wanted to. Well, Maybe the NSA is doing that, you know? Yeah, fact. <laughs> yeah, we're doing it right now. <laughs> yep. Well, I, I, one of the other things that we look at when, when we, we think of speech analytics, and Ashish and I spend a lot of time on this with, um, you know, we, I, you described the two versions of speech analytics of, of the historical hate, so I can go back and find things that happened in the past. Then there's the real time that says I need to trigger an event most typically associated with hey, go get a, a supervisor to join this call because it's not going well. And then there's almost the, the third kind of real time that is really focused more on, 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 the, on the preventative version of this where, 
you know, you've got a screen, uh, a dashboard for the agent themselves, and in the middle of the call, we can prompt that agent to, hey, you know, hey, this, this customer is a perfect candidate for one view, talk about it to them. And then not only just hoping that they talk about it, but okay, did they actually say, you know, did they use one view in the, in the conversation? And that's the whole, um, you know, real-time speech search of the engagement development platform or EDP. So it kind of adds a third category to this of, you know, something that's really more on the fly, dynamically prompting an agent to, to say the things we want them to say, um, you know, for whether it's campaign or compliance, you know, we want to make sure that they say, hey, this call is going to be recorded, um, whatever we want them to say to verify that they did it real time. And Ashish always used, uses the scenario of his, his electric car, right, that if, um, you know, a lot of the, the benefits of, of an electric car with the gas mileage isn't so much the, the idea of the electric nature of the electric car, but it's the reporting that always seems to come with them, where you talk to anybody who has an electric car, they – Andrew was telling me this. He's got a, a Prius, and he's like, you play games with yourself of, oh, can I squeak out, oh, you know, just point two uh, more miles per gallon on on this, and and okay, how can I how can I squeak out a little bit more because of the real time nature, you know, it's, it's the statistics are being presented to you, the guy who's actually manipulating and doing the driving, um, as opposed to a week later, somebody tells you, hey, by the way, you drove kind of crappy last week. Oh, uh, okay. Thanks. Good. Good to know. Um, I'll try more harder next time. Whereas if it's presented to you in real time of, hey, this is how you can improve this call by saying these things, that becomes a really powerful thing. Right. And then in addition to that, I mean, that's that's a, uh, it's not new. It's been out for a little bit of time, but I'm going to say relatively new in all these products is this real time speech thing. And again, like you said, it can be for the agent to do something on the call, or it could be to a supervisor to get on the call, whatever the case may be. But again, it's it's expectation setting with the customer. I mean, it's not a perfect science. And I've seen it work. Um, I've seen it when it doesn't work. So, you know, it takes that fine tuning. There, there's not like you're going to take this out of the box. It's not like it's going to work. And every call that you think they say, um, one view, it's going to come up and pop this message because of the fact that it has to be tuned. And it takes a while to do that. I mean, that's a good six-month process before you really have a even historical speech analytics, uh, but more real-time speech analytics to actually work the way you want it to work. So it, it's, it's a very important to set the customer's expectation when you get involved in engagement like that. So what do you do in terms of those creating those kind of scopes? I mean, do you, you know, we have a lot of customers that want to not to exceed, you know, dollar amount. And, and is that realistic yeah. in these environments or do you, do you buffer it in or, or, you know, how do you, how do you establish those scopes to account for that level of chaos that is probably going to yeah, happen? Yeah, because it's fine tuning. And the fine tuning is, is, it has to be done by something called, um, um, what's the word? I, I brought it up before. I forget the terminology. Um, but there's an application. It's actually a desktop phonetic boosting. It's actually a desktop client. But, you know, it's more like I, in, in my mind that would have to almost be professional services because I, it's very difficult to do. But professional services sitting down, because you have to stand with the customer and understand what their environment is, what words they want, how we want to, uh, you know, phonetically create them in the system. So, I have not really seen anybody being trained on that. So it's pretty much all professional services when it comes to the tuning. And that, as I said, it takes three days, and, of course, depending where the person is, you really want to do it on site because you really want to be there. You want to talk to different uh, te team leads, supervisors, agents, et cetera, get all that information, and then you do the first group because those are also a big part of it is you have to kind of see what speech analytics has done. So you've got to kind of view some calls and go through and see what words have not been transcribed, what words have been transcribed. So, you know, that's pretty much a bolting gig and not as much training. You can train the end user how to use that phonetics boosting, and but, you know, then say, oh, and that training, believe it or not, to use it, it's not that difficult. You could train somebody in one, two, three days, um, but then – you leave them to go off on their own to say, well, you've got to keep doing this every other month. You've got to do this and do this and do this and do this. It's not like it's going to happen in one month or two months. 
And that's a good consulting gig for someone to do because if I was a customer, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, but see, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of the difference. So you could do one, either or, but I have not really seen customers wanting to get trained on it. They look at it and see what's involved and say, okay, you do it. And uh, again, it does take time. Well, I think, yeah, just, you know, the idea of, I, we, we talk about call center tune-ups all the time, right? You know, being able to, you know, prescribe these kind of, of recurring engagements to go back and, yeah, we're going to, these are, these, yeah. this is what you do. And we go in and you're, you're, you're never way. done. Mm-hmm. You just keep coming back. Yeah. It sounds like a great way to get recurring revenue. Yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah, they they're, they're going to need it. And once they, one, as I said, once you see it, as I said, I've done a couple installations, and out of the box, it's great. You see a call; it was transcribed. You see the audio waves. You see the text, and, and you go through the call, and you go, "Why? It like transcribed like one out of three words." I said, "What do you mean? What's going on?" And then it's it, it's it's a special language module you have to get, and the language module out of the box is very very basic. And that's why it doesn't really do that well. And, and yeah, it, it, that's. But again, it's expectation setting for the. Good. Hey Jim, why why did performance management and the forecasting scheduling get lumped together with call recording? What's what's the theory? What's why did those two gravitate uh, to each other? What do you mean? I don't know. Well, I guess, you know, when I think of, of performance management with KPIs and the forecasting, like you said, they're getting a lot of that data from CMS, which to me right. sounds more like a, I guess, a reporting thing where everything else sounds more like a call recording. I, know. Uh, I guess the, end, I mean, customer interactions. I mean, you know, trying to gather, you know, anything a company would be interested in from a customer interaction perspective. I mean, they're just trying to bring in anything and everything dealing with a customer interaction. And, um, but the, the WFO platform, that, that term that's been used, typically, yeah, is your recording is your number one, and then the performance management and KPIs, and then the QM, and then the WFM. So most companies, uh, you see so, I think another, to expand on the, your question, or my thought on, you know, why is workforce management included in the WFO portfolio? I think the idea there is the manufacturers, the vendors, the way we've seen it, when you see how it's positioned as a full suite and to have customers try and adopt all the modules within the suite, they try and really emphasize the synergy between, say, call recording and more specifically QM or quality monitoring or assurance and how it plays into the concept of forecasting and scheduling. For example, if you take an agent and you're scoring that <clears throat> that call based on information that you're pulling from the call recording itself, and you determine, say, that that agent needs some training. So the synergy piece there is you're going to assign some training in the quality monitoring or quality management module, and then the synergy rolls into the forecasting and scheduling application and automatically adjusts the schedule based on the assigned training. So I think the reason they pull, um, they pull it together in that in that suite of products is they're really trying to show the synergy and help customers understand that when you the more of the modules you adopt together, the more synergistic it's going to be. Well, that's awesome. That's that's a good perspective. That's cool. It, 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 and, again, in that context, it, it absolutely makes I'm sense. Thank everybody, starting with uh, with Jim and, and everyone else in the panel, and everybody who's offered up comments and questions. Appreciate your attendance. Um, it was a good good showing, and uh, happy to have everybody on. Um, uh, until then, I want to thank everybody and uh, have a fantastic weekend. We'll see ya.